by the boot of Aaron. Okay, thank you. Someone flip the lights off for us, please. All right, this, I believe, was the problem that we we left out on. So we had the points negative 2, negative 5, which is down here. That's x. And then we had, uh, so this is yesterday's notes that we didn't finish, negative 2, positive 3. That's y. And they ask us to find x, y. Well, how far is that distance? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So x, y as a distance is 8. And then it asks us to find uh, w, which was negative 4, 3, and z, which was 4, 3. And they wanted us to find w, z, so that distance. So count how far that is. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So WZ is also to 8. So is there a conclusion you can make off of these two segment lengths just by looking at what we have up there? So this segment right here, and then this segment right here. What can we say about those two segments just about this? Yeah? Mm, can't really, well, I maybe could say they're perpendicular, but... I don't know, yeah. They're equal. So yeah, the, the term that we'll use is congruent. So we could simply say that the reason that something like that can be said is I have something equal to 8, I have something else equal to 8. That means they're both equal to 8, so they must be the same size. Um, that This is an actual property that you get to later called the transitive property which could be looked at as almost a substitution idea. So that's the first thing we've said. There's nothing more for the rest there. All right. Ooh, another movable part. Blank. Two segments or angles with the same measure. Congruent. There we go. So we had just said that. So congruent are two segments or angles that have the same measure. It's the equal sign with the little tilde or whatever it's called. Little curvy on top of it. And then if we were to graph point A, point B, point C, point D, we would also be able to verify if AB is congruent to CD. So A is 0, 1. And then B is 4, 1. And so the segment of A to B is 1, 2, 3, 4. So this one happens to be 4. And then if we do CD, I have 1, 2, and 1, 6, and then 1, 2, 3, 4. That's also a distance of 4. So they, AB has got to be congruent to CD because it's the same length. I mean, we found they're both 4, a distance of 4, and I'm just using either the distance formula or just counting because they're just falling into a straight line. We A okay? So midpoint, the point of a segment that divides a segment into two congruent segments. A segment bisector is a point, line segment, or ray that intersects a segment at its midpoint. So a midpoint, you just cut a line segment into two equal parts. Okay, and if you knew that the distance was 10, that means that if, if you had the midpoint each segment with it being 5 and 5. I have to look down at the sun. <coughs> we good or do I, can I get a hold of us? Almost? What about now? What about now? I'm fun on a road trip, especially when I'm driving. Yeah, babe. I'll get them fixed for you. Thanks for double checking. Oh, it's not me. What? Some of these things that we're hitting right now are very obvious, but we want to get into the motion of saying, let's go through, obviously, a midpoint is the center. It's cutting things into two equal parts. 
then we can start saying that because of this definition that we could apply that to other things that might be a little bit more complex. We good? So it tells us that CD, let's move that down a smidge, says CD bisects AB at point E. A, B at point A. So C, D bisects, so this line right here bisects A, B. If they tell us that A to E is 10 centimeters, which we have labeled, find the length of A to B. Well, if this line cuts this and this into two equal parts, we could go ahead and say, and I know I'll off a little bit, we can say that we know that AE plus EB is equal to, and as far as segments go, is equal to AB. And the reason we say that is a segment addition postulate, which we talked about yesterday. Okay, so that's kind of a given. So then we could go a little bit further. We could say that we know that 10 plus EB is equal to AB. And the reason we can say that is we use substitution. And then from, yeah? No. So how do you know that both of the sides are equal, like A, E, and E, B? Oh, so I'm going to start defining that. It said that CD bisects a certain angle. Oh, okay. So my next thing that I'm going to say is that A, E is congruent to E, B because of the definition of a bisector. So I'm going to say find the length of AB. So if we knew that, we want to find the length of AB or AE. So what I can do is I can actually say this and see if you can figure out what I'm going to do with this one. Does it appear that I did? The clue comes down here. What did I do between this lock, this one I'm going to put a star next to, and the purple to get to the smiley face? What miracle of math? Yeah. Exactly what I did. I used the substitution property, okay, in order to plug it in. And then from there, I could say, I already know that AE equals 10, so then I can go 10 plus 10 equals AB, because we already know that this was taking place, so we substitute it again at this step. And then once you do that, then you can just say that AB is equal to 20, and then what did you do? It was an addition. You added 10 and 10. So what I'm starting to get at is we're getting into something called a proof. And don't allow someone to tell you that a proof is not a significant part of math. A proof is a very significant part because it is the reasoning behind why can we go from this to this? Why can we go to this to this? There's going to be a point in many of your experiences with math, and you're going to start getting into math that most of the people in the world don't understand. You get up through Calc 2, you're doing better than like 95% of the people on the planet as far as math goes. I mean, if that's a goal of yours, that's awesome. Calculus is a beautiful, beautiful class. It's unbelievable. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Okay? Hannah, where are you at? Hannah H.? Jillian R. Oh. So what we're doing with math is we are using the rules that we know to apply to go back to it. This is something that we're going to start getting to that's called deductive reasoning. 
We're going through the steps. We're going through the motion. You have used deductive reasoning all your life. You've seen this at the mall. There's people that use it at the mall. I'm going to pick on the mall because the mall is a fun place for people to watch. I hate shopping. When my wife will drive me to the mall, to the mall I sit there and I make up conversations in my mind that people are having. I, I'm weird. I'm sorry. You already know I laugh when people fall. Now I add, add to people's conversations. Um, but you've seen this. The door says pull. They push away. Now, the people, bless you, who have got a little bit more advanced knowledge in their head realize, oh, I just pulled when I should push, and they push the same door to get into it. But have you, you probably have seen this. You get a person that pulls and says to push, and boom. And then they'll see a door like three down that'll open, and someone comes out of it, and they'll walk down. And oh, good. That one's open. Yours is open too, there, genius. It's just you're too dumb. To, I'm sorry if this is you. You're just too dumb to push. Um, I've had, even seen people at the mall where they're looking in. Yeah, I see people in there. Should be open. Push. You know it's a four-letter word. Starts with P. Hot. Caution hot. What do you do? Touch it, and then you tell to your tell your friend, it really is hot. <coughs> and then what does your friend do? They touch it and go, oh, no, you're right. We just discovered they put a sign here for a reason. Wet paint? Forget about it. Someone's touching it. Wet cement? Is it really it really is wet? Look at that. My foot mark's still there. So you've gone through this type of thinking, but I'm putting it on a silly perspective, but that's what the thinking takes place. <clears throat> S is the midpoint. So by what you know right now, what can you do with this problem? If you know that S is the midpoint, what's okay to say? Yeah. RS equals MC. Okay. So, I mean, I could go through this. Segment addition. I could, you know, state something like that. I could state that uh, RS is equal to 5X minus 2. And I could state that uh, ST is equal to 3X plus 8. And this was something that we will in real simple terms, say this was given to us. And then we could go a little bit further to say that 5x minus 2 plus 3x plus 8 is equal to RT, which that might not help you, but I could tell you the whole thing is 8x plus 6 in length. But then they tell you that this is a midpoint, so then you could say, well, I can easily state that RS is congruent to ST. The reason I say that is definition of midpoint. And then you can go from there and say, well, I know I have this equals this because of substitution. You know, they told you RS was this, they told you ST was this. You're using substitution. And then you can just use algebra and solve and say, well, I get 2x over here and I get 10 over here. So I have now found that x is equal to 5. Did we solve for x? Yeah, it was Algebra 1 we were able to use, a two-step or three-step equation. Okay, do you need to go all this process? That's the hardest thing for me to convince you to start doing because the logical thought process will indeed start conveying the better message throughout math. Okay, why can you say this? But why can you say this? But why can you say this? Is what the teacher is going to ask often. And, well, it says... I need a little bit more than, well, it says. It's right there. I need a little bit more than it's right there. Tell me why you can state a certain scenario. And that's, that's where you're going with this math. Okay, we're not quite there yet, so don't be like, oh my gosh, I've been doing all my math totally wrong. No, you haven't. You've been doing fine. I just want to model for you what we're going to start getting to. We are going to start modeling that we can prove this is going to take place because we have these rules that are put in place. We have certain things that are given to us about the problem that are going to allow us to move through the problem. Okay? Did I solve for x? Yes. 
it, what if it asked, how long is RS? What would you have to do? You'd have to plug X back in in order to find it. If they asked you, hey, how long is RT? You'd have to substitute 5 back in for X and add them together. That, and so there's math that's taking place. There's a logical progression of events. But the proof is the part that it's so hard, especially as a teenager, and you're totally normal as teenagers. I don't want to, you, a lot of people won't tell you that. Unfortunately, society says, oh, our, our society is screwed up because our kids. Really, it's probably not our kids that screwed up society. I hate to tell you, you're allowed to be a kid. And I, my best advice to all of you, whether you learn, learn anything in my class or not, is be a kid as long as you can. You have the rest of your life to be an adult. Okay? That's why I stopped teaching. I still can't. Can I move on? It's being recorded if you need to take a look. Okay, identify the segment by sector of AC. So we have two little tick lines that are put. So what can you tell me about AB and BC? Well, the bisector appears to be what? Or the bisector. What is bisector? Oh, what? The ray. Yeah, identify the bisector. Ray BD. Is ray BD the same thing as ray DB? No. The start first letter is the important one. Okay, so that's our bisector. Find the length of AC. Find the length of AC. What can you guarantee me right now about 5x minus 2 and x plus 22? What can you say? Yeah. They're congruent. They're congruent. So we're going to use their equal because we're not going to refer to the segments. We're just going to use the algebra. And I'm stepping away from the proofy, the proof of it right now. But I can easily state that because, one, definition of a bisector, we're given right there on our diagram that AB and BC are congruent to each other because of the tick marks. From there, we can solve the problem getting this at 4x equals 24. So x is equal to 6. Was it asking us to solve for x? No. Is the problem done? No. We're partially there. You're going to miss some points if you don't realize that you need to plug 6 back in. So I get uh, 28 and 28. So this distance here is 28, and this distance here is 28. And if I wanted to find what AC is, 28 and 28 is 56. I do that math right? I hope. Can I move on? Okay, so that's where your worksheet's going to come in. But I want to give you a second page now uh, of notes. And this will actually go a little bit quicker. So what I'll do is I will tell you that tomorrow worksheet 1.2 will be complete, should be completely done. I will mark it off. You have the knowledge to do it. But I won't be that guy to say you also need to get 1.3 done by tomorrow. Is that all right? Is that fair? Because I don't want to be the guy going, oh, yeah, we get four hours of homework. Yeah, question. Wait, should we start 1.3? Yeah, I would, I'm going to give you the same type of directions. Eventually, we'll catch up to where we should be. There might be other classes that are further along from us, but they don't have means for a teacher, so you guys you guys get a hobble along. And I apologize. Find angles and applying angle postulates. Okay. 
excess previously, proficiency, for naming angles and classifying them by their measures, develop an understanding for the angle addition and subtraction postulates, and develop an understanding of angle bisectors. What do you think of an angle bisector? Something that cuts an angle in two, moving the parts, yeah. And then apply new knowledge to solve problems. All right, you ready? Nothing down here, so no, no pushing. All right, angle, sides, vertex. Okay, an angle. So an angle is two different rays with the same endpoint is an angle. Two rays and then the endpoint. Uh, Two different rays with the same endpoint. The two rays are the sides, and then the endpoint is the vertex. Okay, so so this is your angle, your sides, and then the vertex is whatever that point would be. Can you name an angle with one point? <coughs> I were to say, this is angle B, and I'm going to use a little angle thing. Is that okay? Good idea. Nice. So I can name an angle with one point. The best thing to do is if you have three points, Label it A, B, and C, where the center letter is your vertex. Okay, so that's a little better way to, to label an angle. But sometimes you might only be given a here's angle B or here's angle J or something like that. Okay, two rays with the same endpoint is an angle. Two rays are your sides, and then the endpoint where those rays take off from is the vertex. The turning point, the place where we switch directions. Can I move? How do you name angles? Well, angle sign. Why did I name it that way? Angles are usually named by listing a point on one ray and then the vertex and the point on the other ray. The vertex must be in the middle. We also use the angle symbol. So is angle RPB, would you think that would be the same thing as angle PBR? Yes. We know that the middle letter is the vertex, but you can name an angle two different ways with the letters. And you can be backwards and forwards, it means the same thing. Hmm. I'm off out of cold. I don't know why I that kid that was sneezing in the hallway, I just decided to walk through the mist going, May I move on? Woo! There we go. If the vertex of an angle belongs to only one angle, then the angle could be named using just by the vertex. Okay, so I could say, bless you. Angle S, angle U, angle T work for me. I could say angle 1, angle 2, angle 3, angle 4, angle 5, or angle 6. That's okay. Um, if I did have a triangle and I was trying to identify 
if I had one and only one triangle and wasn't alternative lines coming off of it, I would name it probably using three letters. So I do have angle SUT, I have angle UTS, and I have angle TSU. And that's just referring to the different angles as I go around the triangle. Angles one through six, those have to just be sitting in a specific location. So you can just name those and add this number as far as the diagram goes. You don't have to do um, three numbers to name it. So if the vertex of the angles belong to only one angle, then the angle can be named just by the vertex. Name the three angles in the diagram. Can I just say angle X? No, it's being shared, correct? So is one of the angles WXY? What's another one? YXZ, what's the third one? WXZ, the whole big thing. So you have three angles. You have this angle here, you have this angle here, and then you have the whole angle here. Whole angle here, if I can draw. So angle W X Y, angle W uh, X Z, and angle Y X Z. They're all appropriate. The X is the center letter. This is the vertex. It's the corner. It's the turning point of it. You could say. You know, just going as far as the angle addition postulate, we could talk about it. I'm sure it's on the next slide. But I could say that the reason you can say that is I add two angles together, they give me a bigger angle. Angle subtraction would work as well just by moving it over. We can refer to the measure of an angle we use. What is this? When we refer to the measure of an angle, we use measure of ABC. And then angle ABC means this is the physical angle itself. So if we knew the measure of an angle ABC, it would be measure of angle ABC equals 60 degrees. If we're just talking about the angle, we don't have to put the M. The M just talks about we're using the measure of that angle. Time see what kind of dorky stories I can tell. <coughs> angles can be classified for their angles between zero and ninety degrees, between ninety and one eighty. So 0, 90, 90, 180, that works pretty well. There's others that go along with this. But when we start talking about the Cartesian plane, talking about quadrants 1, 2, 3, 4, these will come into play a little bit more. So angle of 180 degrees. Name three acute angles, name two obtuse angles, name a straight angle, name a right angle. Okay, is there something we should do? Okay. 
Name three acute angles. What's acute? Less than 90. Less than 90? So could I say angle SIU? Is that okay to say that's less than 90? Angle NIS? Less than 90? Um, what about that angle right there? Name two obtuse angles. What's an obtuse angle? Less than 90, less than 90. Bigger than 90, less than 180. So let's choose the letters. Is angle VIS obtuse? How would you know? That's 90 degrees right there. This is bigger. What about this angle right here? The angle... U, I, R? Absolutely. Anyone know what a straight angle is? Yeah. Yeah, what about? Oh, the definition? Yeah. It's 180 degrees. 180 degrees. So a straight angle would be N, I, B. So a straight angle is just 180 degrees. Sometimes it's called linear pairs, sometimes it's called supplementary angles, depending on we're putting things together. Yeah? Can I have put instead of VIS, can I switch to SIB? Yep. You can just keep the I in the middle. And then would NIR be obtuse? Uh, it appears that it would work. Uh, the reason that would actually work is because this angle here and this angle here are called vertical angles to each other. And so being that SIB is obtuse, that means that NIR is the exact same size angle because it's a vertical angle. So yes, it would be obtuse. <coughs> and then name a right angle. That's a 90 degree angle. So angle UIB, because it's labeled. Could I label UIN? Yes. Why could I do that? Because BIN is a straight angle. BIN is 180 degrees. So that would tell me that UIN would have to be 90 because I already know the other part of it is UIB, which is also 90. And I just spent way too much time on that. G is an acute angle, so it's less than 90 degrees. If G is 7x minus 8, find the limits of the value of x. So angle G is less than 90 degrees, yes? And then they tell us that measure of angle G is equal to 7x minus 8. So then I want to say, okay, 7x minus 8 has to be less than 90 degrees. So let's create our limits. So if I plug 14 in for x, I wind up with 7 times 14 minus 8, which gives us 90. I want to stay less than 90. So my limits of this, oops, I know that I want to be larger than 0, less than 14. Is that a point that I'm using up there? No. This is one way of writing the limits. The way that we might be aiming towards it is might we might say 0 is less than, not equal to, 0 is less than x, which is less than 14. This encompasses all numbers that are bigger than 0 and less than 14. We go up to 13.9 forever. We go down to 0, 0.0 forever with a 1 that might take place. So the smallest all the way, it's very close to 0 all the way up to 14. Yeah? So would, did you get, so for 7x minus 8 is less than 90, did you get that from Above. 90 degrees? So they told us that angle G is less than 90. Okay. So I know I have to plug in less than 90 into our problem. Oh, okay. 
Oh. And then we told, they told us that measure of angle G is 7x minus 8. So we solved that using the inequality. So we knew our values had to be less than 14. So I plug 14 or larger in, I get a value bigger than 90 degrees or equal to 90. But acute is less than 90 degrees. It can't be up to 90 degrees at a right angle. And so the, any of the points that I plug in from 0 up to 14, not including those as endpoints, would give us the boundary G for our angle. So I guess our angle could be I'm off a smidge. One of my limits is wrong. The 14 is correct. The 0 is wrong, like I said. <coughs> What's that? It's negative. What does x have to be? Greater than 1. 7 times 1 is 7 minus that. 7 times 2 is too big. If I did 1.1, that becomes 7.7. .7. That's still less than that. My zero is wrong. What should it be? 1.2. What is 7 times 1.2? Um, I should do it like this. Do that instead of this inequality. A number seven, which is one one seven. So I need to change this limit down here to one one seven. Now this is where. The, <coughs> what? Where did that just come from? I can just have the second inequality and I can just go sorry. The first inequality I think everyone's okay with. 7x minus 8 is less than 90. But then we have to realize that we have to have a value bigger than 0 because an acute angle is from bigger than 0 degrees but less than 90 degrees. So 7x minus 8 has to be larger than 0. If we solve that, we get 1017. So my bound is 1017 less than x, which is less than 14, which means we're talking about a value that's larger than 1017. So you plug 1017 in, you get exactly 0. I would probably should just keep it at 8 seconds, but I'm okay with 1017. Oh, that was just a little thing. Yeah? I'm so confused on how you got that. Okay. An acute angle is between 0 and 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. We already solved that for the 90 degrees, but we now need to figure out what's the bottom limit that would be bigger than 0 degrees. So I just set up the same inequality as 7x minus 8 and made it greater than 0. Uh, cool. Moving on. Angle addition postulate. Uh, works for me. Oh, we have an arrow here. You just make me or do something weird here. A whole angle is equal to the sum of, it, of its parts. Create new territory there, Ghost Rider. The whole angle is equal to the sum of its parts. So this angle to this angle equals the big angle. Okay. Same with the bottom. Good enough? Almost done. Only like 90 minutes left. In a similar manner, we can reverse this concept and create the segment subtraction, okay? So why can we say that MST, so this angle here, whoa, 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 whoa. why can we say that this angle here, <coughs> MST, is equal to this angle here? The reason is they would have had to have told us that this angle here is equal to this angle here. So we know that AST 
if we add that angle to both angles we already know are congruent, then the two bigger angles that are added to it would work. So we know MAT is 2x minus 9. We know that HAT is 3x plus 6. We know that the whole angle is 72, so we have 2x minus 9. That's 3x plus 6 equals 72. Solve it algebraically. I think you're okay. 5x minus 3 equals 72. 5x equals 75. x equals 25. No. Find the measure of MAT, so once you figure out what X is equal to because of this, you can then plug that back in to get the two angles. Are these two equal angles? I don't know. I don't think so. It didn't tell us they were, so we can't say that the two angles are half of 72 or 36 each. Find the angle of CBD. So X plus 1 plus 2X plus 2 equals... <coughs> What? 90. Why is that? It's the right angle. They have the rectangle on the side. So we can still continue with that. So if I add this angle to this angle, the two angles have to equal 90 degrees. Then we can plug the x back in and find each individual angle. RST is a straight angle, so RST must be how many degrees? 180. So 10x minus 5 plus 4x plus 3 equals 180. Do your algebra. Once you solve for x, you can plug x back in. So this plus this equals 180. And then you can solve it algebraically. If two angles have the same measure, then they are congruent. <coughs> Blank angles can be shown with the same number of tick marks on each side, so congruent angles as well. So a double tick to double tick would mean C and D are equal. Single tick to single tick would show that A and B are the angles are equal. Angle bisector, what can you tell me about these two angles? What can you, that's a bisector, what can you tell me about this and this? That's the bisector, it cuts this into two equal parts. So this angle here and this angle here are equal to each other. So if we add algebraically two different things, we could easily plug those in. <coughs> Excuse me. We know that these have to be equal to each other. Or They're equal to each other, solve it, then plug back in for x to find each angle, add them together. And that's about as far as I can go. So for tomorrow, work is it worksheet 1.2 we started? Okay, I will be marking that off tomorrow. Start 1.3. But I won't mark it off tomorrow. Sound like a deal? How many more slides we got? Oh, that's it? <laughs> and then, things to know, we will have a quiz on Friday on these sections. Uh, we'll start, we'll have 1.3 is just start this. 1.2 will be marked off. And then that's about all I got. Feel good? Did I go too fast? I only taught for 44 minutes, 29.